right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat Your Pants event. My name is Joe Gorowski, and I'll be your host for today. February is one of our absolute favorite months here. Uh, every February, we kick all the men out for the month, and we host women in science and exploration from all over the world, uh, sharing their adventures, their stories, their conservation work, their research, expeditions. It's a lot of fun. Today, uh, we're really excited to have Kristen Lear joining us. She is a bat conservationist and environmental educator. She got her start in bat conservation at age 12 when she built and installed bat houses for her Girl uh, Scout Silver Award project. Since then, she's traveled the world, including the US, Australia, and Mexico, to learn how to protect endangered bats and to share her passion with the public. So I'm gonna quickly bring Kristen in here to say hi. How are we doing today, Kristen? I am good, how are you all? We're good. It's great to have you joining us today. We've got classrooms joining from across North America, Canada and the US, even Mexico today. Uh, they're excited to get to know you a little bit better. But before we let you take over, I want to shout out to the classrooms on YouTube. Those who are tuning in, use it as an opportunity in the chat bar to introduce yourselves, where you're watching from, uh, send us in some questions there as well. And then anybody, whether you're in the classroom or at home, get a pencil, a paper, some pencil crayons ready because Kristen's got a little challenge for us to do a little bat drawing. So I'm looking forward to see what kind of drawings come out of it. So Kristen, I'll let you take over for a bit. Thank you, everyone. I'm super excited to be here today to talk about bats. Uh, we're going to talk about some really cool bat species around the world. And like Joe mentioned, we are going to get to draw our own bats. So gather your pencils and papers or markers, crayons, whatever, and we will get started. So I'm going to start sharing my screen while you gather your materials, and then we'll get started. Okay, can y'all can y'all see me? Yeah, looks okay, good. Good. Okay. So okay, I've got got your pencils and papers. Um, today we're going to talk about cr the crazy cool world of bats. Uh, my name is Dr. Kristen Lear. Uh, I've been working with bats for over 12 years now. Um, in, in many different places, and bats are my favorite animal, so I'm really, really excited to talk to you today about some of my favorites. To get started, I just want to show these two pictures because these are pictures of me when I was 12, when I was in sixth grade, building bat houses for my Girl Scout Silver Award project. This was my first time working with bats. I'd always loved and been interested in bats, but had never gotten to work with them. This was my first hands-on experience. And I just love showing these pictures because it really is never too early to start. If you're interested in wildlife conservation or really anything, you can start learning and start doing that right now, no matter how old you are. So from sixth grade to now, I've studied bats around the world. Um, and now I work at Bat Conservation International, where I work with endangered pollinating bats in the US Southwest and Mexico. So this is kind of my, my dream job and I'm excited to be here today to share a little bit about the wonderful world of bats. So right now we have over 1,400 species or types of bats around the world. This is a lot of bats. And you can see from these pictures that there's a huge diversity of species. They look different, they're different sizes, they have different colors and different shapes, and they eat many different things, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And bats make up about 20% of all mammal species. So they're, they're second only to rodents. They're not rodents. They, they are mammals, but they are not rodents. And so one in every five mammals is a bat. And a really cool thing that recently happened, this just came out last week, is we have discovered a new species of bat in West Africa. And it's this orange furred bat here. So this just shows that we are constantly learning, explorers and scientists are constantly going out and discovering new species, even new bat species. So bats really are pretty much all around the world. They're on every continent except Antarctica. So they're in all of these orange areas. They're found in lots of different environments, basically everywhere except the, the polar, really cold polar regions and extreme deserts. But like I said, they live in many different environments. So when we think of bats, a lot of times we think forests and trees, and this is definitely one of the, the main habitats or places that bats live. But bats can also live in places like deserts that's a lot drier and a lot hotter. 
or places like prairies that don't have as many trees. They can roost in rocks or in crevices of, uh, of cliff faces even. And they can roost in some pretty cold places. They can live in places like Alaska. There's five species that we know of that are found in Alaska. So even if it's cold, bats can still be found there. And bats are also found in urban areas, so in cities. So if you see a bat flying around your park or your school, your house, that's totally normal. Bats can live in cities and around people. And like I said, bats are mammals, but they are not rodents. So bats are not birds. Bats have fur, just like we do. We have hair, they have fur. Uh, they give birth to live young. They feed milk to their, their baby, uh, just like we do. So they are mammals, but again, not rodents. And bats have a diversity of diets. So lots of different bats eat lots of different things. So the majority of bats around the world, about 70% eat insects. So these bats are eating things like moths. You can see this one here has a big moth in its mouth, katydids, even some bats eat cockroaches and some bats do eat mosquitoes. So these bats are eating pesky insects like mosquitoes and agricultural pests that eat our corn, cotton, pecan crops and many other crops. So these bats are helping control those insects and help protect our crops. So bats are really, really important for agriculture. And to put this in perspective, some bat species can eat up to half their body weight in insects every night during the summer. That's a lot of insects. So if we had to eat enough quarter pounder hamburgers in one night to be like a bat, how many hamburgers would we have to eat? Now I'll let you kind of think about it and get your, get your numbers down, your guesses. Get your number in your head. Ready? About 150 hamburgers you would have to eat. That's a heck of a lot of hamburgers and I don't think I could do it. But these bats are flying around so they need a lot of energy and that's why they're eating so many insects. Now some bats, about 30% of bats around the world, a little less than 30%, um, are nectar feeders. So they eat nectar from flowers, just like hummingbirds and butterflies and moths and bees do. And you can see they get into the flower and they shove their head deep inside the flower to lap up the nectar. And when they do that, they get covered in pollen. And bats often get much more covered in pollen than hummingbirds, for example. And so these bats are really good at spreading pollen and pollinating plants. And there are over 300 different plants around the world that are either primarily bat pollinated or exclusively pollinated, so only by bats. Some of these plants that rely on bat pollination, bananas, raise your hand, I can't see anyone, but I know raise your hand if you like bananas. I know I sure do, I had one for breakfast this morning. What about mangoes? I definitely love mangoes. What about nuts, things like cashews? I love the nuts in the Snickers bars especially. What about avocados? I'm a huge fan of avocados. Now, what about, this is my favorite, chocolate. So cacao that we get from plants makes chocolate. All of these things are pollinated by bats. So without bats, we would not have these foods. Now, some bats around the world eat fruit. So they're eating things like fig, like in this picture. And what these fruit bats do is they basically shove the fruit into their mouth and you can see they, they shove it in there and they squeeze the juice out and drink the juice and then they spit the rest of the fruit out and what is in the rest of the fruit seeds and those seeds will grow into new plants so these fruit bats are really good at helping regenerate or regrow places like tropical rainforests and again, bats often fly a lot farther than other animals, so they're often a lot better at dispersing seeds than other animals. So without bats, we would not have places like tropical rainforests. Now some bats, really cool bats, eat other animals, so they're carnivorous and meat-eating. This, this poor little frog here is about to get eaten by a fringe-lipped bat, um, but this is what they, what they specialize in. Some bats eat birds, at night, so they'll catch birds. Uh, birds migrate a lot of times at night, so they'll catch the birds while they're flying. 
And some bats do eat other mammals. Like this one, this ghost bat from Australia has a mouse, but some bats even eat other smaller bat species. And there's even a few bats around the world that eat fish and they actually go fishing to catch bats from the water here. You can see it's dragging its feet over the water to catch the fish. And I'll have a cool video in a minute to show you how they do this. And then we have the vampire bats. So we have three species of vampire bats in the world. Out of over 1400 species, only three eat blood. And these are found in Mexico and South America. And you can see this one here, it's got their little noses and their eyes, and just like the other bats. And this one here on the, in the white is one that I caught in Mexico when I was doing my research. Um, and vampire bats are really cool because they're very social. They, they help feed each other in their colony. They have very tight friend and family groups. So I think vampire bats are one of my favorite species. Now bats have tons of cool adaptations to help them survive. And if you don't know, an adaptation is a trait or a behavior that helps an animal survive. So this can be something physical or it can be a behavior. So one of the, the cool things about all bats is that of course all bats fly. They're the only mammal in the world that can truly fly. And in order to do this, they have super flexible wings. So I'm gonna show you this video and we can see just how maneuverable the bats are with their flexible wings. Do you see how those wings are kind of floppy? And they can get in through really tight spaces and they can dodge things really quickly as they're flying because they have these flexible wings. So that's one of the adaptations that all bats have in order to fly. Now, some bats also have fur, that's the color of their environment, which is called camouflage. So some bats like this one here, can you see this one? Try to find it, this one's a little easier. You can see this little bat there hanging on a tree trunk. So it blends into the bark. It has the same color of fur as the bark. Uh, this one is an Eastern red bat that we have here in the United States. It's very common found in the Eastern US. Uh, can you see it? There's a bunch of leaves. Try to find where that one is. This one's a little tougher. There it is. You can see its little arm and its fur and it's hanging from the branches. And again, being able to camouflage helps it hide from predators so they don't get eaten. Now, some bats, not all, but some bats do echolocate, which means they use sonar. So all bats can see, all bats have eyes just like we do, and they can see a little bit better than we can at night. But because some of these insect eating bats are flying around really fast at night, it's really dark, and they're hunting these little tiny insects, they use the sonar or echolocation to help them find where they're going. <clears throat> and to help them echolocate and to help them hear where they're going, they have these, some, some insect eating bats have these gigantic ears. So these are just some of my favorite big eared bats. This is the spotted bat that we have in the Western part of the United States. And they have the biggest ears of any bat in the world. And you can see if we had ears their size, our ears would be probably about three to four feet long, which would be huge ears. So, but this, again, this helps them hear their echolocation and helps them find insects. Now the nectar feeding bats, these are some of my favorite bat species because I've worked with them and gotten to actually see them up close. These nectar bats often have really, really long tongues. So can you see what's coming out into this tube? This is some, some sugar water here. What's this pink thing that's coming out of its mouth? That's its tongue. Can you see how long that is? Some bats have tongues that are one and a half times their body length. So that would be like if we stood up and put our hands in the air, our tongue would go from our fingertips all the way to the ground. Now, everyone asks me, like, how do they fly with that tongue, you know, flopping around? They actually don't have it flopping around when they're flying. They have a, a cavity, basically, in their chest where the tongue is stored when they're not flying and they're, or when they're not using it. So when they're flying, it's not flopping around. And we'll get to see in this video, we'll get to see this long tongue in action and how it actually goes into the nectar to drink. So the bat's gonna fly up to the nectar and there it goes, that tongue comes all the way out to reach deep inside those flowers to reach the nectar. So it's kind of like a hummingbird, but 
because bats don't have beaks, this is their adaptation. Now, in addition to having these really long tongues, some of these nectar bats have what are called papilla, or they're kind of like hairs that are made from skin, on their tongue. So this is a bat tongue, a nectar bat tongue, with a really um, close up microscopic image. And you can see all these little kind of hairs coming off of the tongue. And these hairs help them lap up the nectar and help them get it into their mouth. So we're gonna see this video here of how those hairs actually work. So we're gonna see the tongue goes in and you can see the hairs are erect. So they're sticking out from the tongue. And then you can see in the next clip, it's gonna pull up the nectar with those hairs. So there's those hairs again. And then they're gonna, it's gonna stick into the nectar and pull it up. See, do you see how it pulls up the nectar into its mouth? So that's how they feed. They have these special adaptations to feed from nectar. Now, fruit bats are very different from insectivorous bats because fruit bats are eating fruit and fruit is stationary, which means it doesn't move. So these fruit bats don't need to chase their prey around. So because of this, they have they don't use echolocation, and instead they have really big eyes and really big noses that they use to see the fruit and to smell the fruit, and that's how they find their prey, which is the fruit. So big eyes and big noses. Now those fish-eating bats that I told you about, I told you they, they actually go fishing. So how do they go fishing? Well, they have these really, really big back feet. So they have five toes just like we do, but their toes are really, really long. And in this video, we're gonna see how they use those big feet to skim the water and catch fish into their mouth. So there it goes over the water and it caught a fish with its back foot and it nabs it. So these fish are kind of on the top of the water, they're swimming around in the water and the, the bat catches it and then goes to a perch and eats the fish. Now those vampire bats, remember I told you that there's three species of vampire bats in the world. These bats have very special adaptations to help them drink and eat blood. Now when I say drink blood, it's not like the movies where we see you know, vampires that will latch onto your neck and suck your blood. That's not what vampire bats do. What they do is they make a very, very small cut, usually in the foot or the leg of an animal, like a cow or a pig, and then they they lap up the blood that flows from that cut, kind of like a cat laps up milk. So they're not actually latching on and sucking. And in order to help that blood flow and to get to the blood, they have very, very sharp front teeth to be able to cut the skin without the animal noticing. And then inside their saliva, they have a special compound or a special uh, thing called an anticoagulant which is just a fancy word for something that helps the blood flow and not clot so that the blood keeps flowing and the bat can keep drinking with its little tongue, you can see there. So these the special anti anticoagulants help them eat, but they also help us because some medicines are being developed from vampire bat saliva and they're called draculin. And this draculin can help treat things like strokes that Per, that are uh, clots, blood clots. So these vampire bats are actually providing medicine for people, which is really cool. Now, I wanna make sure we have plenty of time to draw our own bats. So I want you to all gather up your papers and your pens or markers or whatever you have, and we're going to draw our own bats. So you can draw a bat that we talked about. Remember we have the insect eating bats with the echolocation, the sonar, and the big ears. We have the nectar bats that have the really long tongue that have those little hairs on them. We have the fruit bats that have the really big eyes and the really big noses. We have the uh, fish eating bat that has those big back feet and actually goes fishing. And we have the uh, vampire bats that have the really sharp front teeth and the special saliva that helps them eat. So you can pick one of those or you can create your own bat, create your new species of bat. Uh, remember they have those super flexible wings to fly. Some bats have camouflage. So you can pick any of those and create your own bat species too. 
Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen in a minute, but I know we can't really go around and do too much sharing. So if you create your, uh, your drawings, we would love for you to share on social media. So here are the tags um, on Twitter and Instagram. So please share with us. We'd love to see what you all come up with. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and then um, I will lead you through how to draw a basic bat and then we can add to it from there. And while we're doing the drawings, we can take questions. So. All right, that sounds great, Kristen. Yeah. Well, let's start with our basic bat so everyone can get their basic bat down. So we're gonna first, I'll show you how to do this. I'm gonna first draw the body kind of just the torso of bat. So it's like an oval, or you can make it round, whatever you want. Then we're gonna draw the head. Remember, of course it needs a head. And there's my head. Everyone calls my bat the, a Mickey Mouse bat because I'm not a good artist. So I, I warn you now, it's not gonna be very artistic, but it'll be good to get the point across. So there's the head. Now let's draw some basic feet. Remember, we can make the feet big if it's a fish bat, um, or we can do other, other things with the feet, but there's little, two little feet. And then we're gonna draw some ears. Again, if you wanna make one of the insectivorous bats, you can draw really big ears. I'm gonna draw kind of regular size ears because I think I'm gonna make a nectar bat. So there's the ears. And then we have the wings. So this is kind of the hardest part, but again, doesn't have to be perfect. So here are my bat wings. So you kind of just make it like that. And that's our basic bat. Um, now we can, each of you can add what you want. You can again, add different size eyes, different size noses, bigger feet. Um, you could draw trees if it lives in a tree. So have at it and we'll take questions while everyone is drawing. Okay. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing some bats on social media. So remember those tags. I'll pop those up again uh, near the end of the call as well in a banner so we can check those out. I'm looking forward to seeing lots of cool bat drawings. And I'm looking forward to seeing some that students just make up. I think that'll be pretty cool to see some of the, the species they come up with. All right. Let's start meeting some of our classrooms. We've got a great crew joining us live on YouTube. Remember that chat is for questions. So now's a good time to start putting some of those in and we will get to some of them. Uh, I'm gonna start with some of our live classrooms and a little nervous to bring this first one in. We've got Mr. Smith joining us from Howard Robertson. He's representing some grade four, five and six students. Uh, let's bring him in here. Oh there my go. goodness, I love it. <laughs> there I am. Thank you so much. This is, this has been so informative. Uh, I A lot of the things that have been going on in the chat have been uh, about uh, how much we just didn't know about bats and how diverse they actually are. Um, we wanted to know, how can we help our local bat population? How can we help them to survive? Uh, a lot of people see bats as scary. So, you know, what can we do to best serve uh, our local community? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked that. So there's lots of things that we can all do. Um, I think one of the things that everyone, no matter where you are, can do is tell your friends and family and your classmates what you learned and how, how cool and how important bats are. Um, you know, I think part of why people are afraid of them is because they just, they don't understand them. We don't get to see bats flying around like we do with birds. So they're just kind of mysterious. So if we can kind of get rid of some of that mystery, that I think will help a long, a long way. Um, if you wanna do more concrete things, several things you can do are um, putting up a bat house if you have a yard or if your school has a, an area where you could build and put up a bat house, those actually provide roosting habitat for the bats so they can sleep there during the day. Um, so that's a really a fun thing to do as like a class project. Um, another thing we can do is if you have a garden or if you wanna create a garden, you can plant a bat garden, which is basically you plant night blooming flowers that open at night, which will attract nocturnal insects to drink the nectar that our insectivorous bats can then eat those insects. So you'll have your own little ecosystem, your own little food chain in your garden. Um, there are things called adopt a bat. So several organizations, including Bat Conservation International have these adopt a bat programs where you submit a donation 
um, usually around $30 to $50, and you get a certificate of the bat that you're helping or of the bat species, and that money goes to conservation efforts for bats. Um, there are some bat, uh, like Bat World Sanctuary has actual bats in their care that they, they're like a wildlife vet, basically. Um, and so your donation actually goes to helping individual bats that, that have names. Um, so definitely check those, those websites out They're They're pretty fun. Um, but yeah, those are some, some great ways that kind of everyone can help. All right. Awesome. Great question to start us off. We'll come back your way soon. I'm going to grab one from online here. This is, um, oh, where did it go? There it is. We've got some great four or fives hanging out with Mrs. Gale and they're wondering, uh, how many different kinds of bats are there in the world? Do we have a species count? Yes. So. Um, I, I believe, again, this is always changing, but 1,412. So like I said, we actually just announced the discovery of a new bat last week. So that number is kind of always going up, but it's over 1,400 right now. All right, very cool. And I have a feeling it's not gonna last that way for too long. Nope. <laughs> All right, let's bring in Miss Becker. Miss Becker's group, they are joining us uh, from San Diego, California, some fifth graders, and they were bragging about the warm that they have when we have a lot oh, of snow no. here, but <laughs> oh well. Hey, Miss Becker. Oh, Miss Becker, can you unmute for us? I can. Yes, hello. We were wondering along the same lines, um, how and why do bats have such a, a, a negative, a, a negative uh, they need better social media apparently, and yes. are do they actually carry as many diseases as we all think? Great question. So to get to that like kind of stigma, I think a lot of that has to do kind of with two things. One, like I mentioned before, is that we just don't see bats. We don't experience bats like we do other animals, right? They're out at night, they're in the dark, which is kind of creepy, right? So I think that helps perpetuate that, that scariness aspect, even though they're not scary. Um, and then the other big aspect is media. So movies, TV, literature, you know, in, in scary movies, horror movies, if people are walking through a dark house, you know, what's gonna happen? A bat's gonna fly out at them, right, and scare them. You know, they're not attacking them, but that that they use, the media use bats as a scare tactic um, a lot. And of course we have uh, vampires, you know, the, the vampires and Dracula, the myth of Dracula. So I think all of that together really perpetuates those myths. Um, in terms of your second question, in terms of diseases, there's a lot of research now going into that aspect of, of bats. Um, we, there's no evidence that they have more diseases than, than other animals, um, if you account for the number of species that bats are. Um, but bats are very, very good at fighting off diseases. They're very good at fighting off things like viruses. So even if they get a virus, they don't often get sick from them which is really, really important for us because they have such strong immune systems and they also, off, they don't get cancer really like we do. Um, their DNA does not degrade as quickly as ours does. They live up to 41 years at least. These little tiny bats with very high metabolisms can live over 40 years. So there's research going into studying their immune systems and studying their, their DNA to see if we can develop treatments, uh, medicines for us to live longer and to be able to fight off things like viruses. So I really think bats are the, the key to a lot of these uh, medical advances that we'll see in the future. Great All question. right, great question. Uh, we've got Miss Janko joining us with her Fab Fours. They're just outside of Toronto. How are we doing, Miss Janko? Oh, can you grab the mute for me? <laughs> There okay, a little delayed. Hey, Hi. thank you so much. A lot like our first uh, teacher, the kids are really impressed with all the unique facts uh, for bats. Okay. So uh, one of the questions basically is, uh, how are 
that uh, captured or uh, observed and and because we've learned so much and you we have so much to learn and they're pretty amazed with the new bat and they also want to know what kind of bats in our neighborhood which happens yes, to be called yes. the Rouge River and Lake Ontario. Yeah, that's a great question. So how do we study bats? There's lots of different ways we can study bats. Um, kind of the, the oldest way and, and that it's used a lot is by catching them. And we catch bats by using things called mist nets. So there are these gigantic nets that are like 30 feet long and 20 feet high. And they're basically like hair nets. They look like, you know, what, what you wear on your hair. And the bats, when they're flying, can't see them in time. Remember, all bats can see, but they're flying so fast that they, they run into the net and they get tangled in it. And then we get to go take them out of the net and study them. And then we usually let them go after that. So nets are really one of the ways. But some of the, the new things more recently are things like acoustic detectors, which are these little devices that actually pick up their echolocation calls and then we can identify which species it is based on their calls. Because just like birds, you know, birds, different bird species have different songs and different calls. Same thing with bats, they all have different calls. And so we can use those detectors to, to figure out what species they are. And actually, if you hold on one second, I'll go grab one of the detectors to show you real quick. One second. So one of the new things, like you were mentioning, trying to figure out what bats are in your area, there are now these little acoustic detectors um, that plug into your smartphone. So they're really tiny. They're called echo meter touch detectors and they plug into your smartphone. And then you can, there's an app and you can actually walk around your town, your park or your house and listen for the bats and the app will identify what species it is within, of course, some error, but um, it's a really great way to learn what's in your neighborhood. So um, yeah, if, if anyone wants to learn more, feel free to reach out to me um, and, and I can give you more details. Oh, I think Joe, you're on mute. <laughs> oh, now I did it. Okay, uh, let's grab a question here from YouTube. Um, Okay, so there's um, a grade two class that's joining us from Toronto, and they're curious about, is there any specific type of fish that bats like to eat, or is it more just what's available? Ooh, that's a, a great question. So in terms of the fish that they eat, it's kind of what they're able to catch. Um, it typically is those like smaller minnows, you know, like really small fish, because the bats, the fish eating bats, they're really, their bodies are only like, big so they're not they're not very big so they can't catch a you know a catfish or something big so it's much more of those small little fish good question okay how are all your uh things coming along your drawings i'm excited to see some i know i've got one ready but i i just don't know if it's ready to unveil yet so i might wait a few more minutes before i i don't want to discourage anybody from finishing their pictures so we'll give another another couple minutes uh, I'm going to bring in Mr. Patrick's crew. They're in the classroom. There they are. Grade eights joining us. Uh, I believe, let me just double check in London. Yep. Hey, grade yeah. eights, how are you doing? Look up there. I was wondering how far bats migrate. Oh, I love that question because I, I work with migrating bats, the, some of the nectar bats. So um, they can migrate over 700 miles, 800 miles or more. Um, so these bats are, are flying from places like central Mexico all the way to the U.S. Southwest. That's some of the, the nectar bats that I work with, the Mexican long-nosed bat. Um, yeah, so these are just like monarchs. You know, we hear about monarchs migrating very long distances. Some bats also migrate super long distances, over seven or 800 miles. All right, another great question. We're going to take a little trip to Pennsylvania this time. We've got some fifth graders hanging out with uh, Mrs. Bowers. Let me bring her into the call. Oops, there we go. Hello. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. So one of the students um, in our fifth grade class wanted to know if you're able to keep a bat as a pet. 
Yeah, I get asked this a lot because it would be really cool to have a bat as a pet, wouldn't it? Um, unfortunately, no. Um, bats are wild animals, so they, they need to be out in the wild. And bats are, because they fly, they require a lot of room. So even places like zoos, it can be hard to keep bats in captivity. Um, but just like every wild animal, it should stay in the wild. Um, the one thing that I mentioned before, some places like rehabilitation centers do care for bats and help rehabilitate them to release them back in the wild. So um, they're not pets, but those places get to take care of them. But as you know, as everyday citizens, we cannot keep a bat. All right, fair enough and a good question because I mean, some of them, especially the flying foxes, they do look just super cute, but they definitely super cute. Uh, definitely not the pets you want. Yep. Um, okay, Mrs. Cross, the sixth graders are joining us from Maple, Ontario, and they're curious, uh, would there ever be a reason uh, a bat might attack a person? Or, you know, you see it on TV and stuff all the time. Is it more just get me out of this house or what's going on? Yeah, so... Great question. So when you see a bat flying around a person, usually what they're doing is they're either investigating you because bats are very smart and they're very curious. So they're kind of just like flying around you to, to check out what you are um, or they're feeding on insects that are flying around you. So mosquitoes or gnats often are flying around you. So those bats are trying to eat those insects. So they're actually not attacking you. They're just flying close to you because there's insects there. Um, if you get a bat in your house and it seems like it's diving at you, again, it's not attacking you, it's just afraid and it's trying to find a way out of your house. Um, so that's kind of why it's flying around crazily like that. Um, in terms of sick bats, you know, bats can get sick just like we can or just like any other wild animal. Most of the time those bats will fly away and, and go out and die somewhere and they won't, they won't get interacting with people. Um, if you do find a bat or any other wild animal like on the ground, definitely you don't want to handle it with your bare hands. Um, you know, bats can bite just like any animal. Um, so you'd want to use like a shoe box and have an adult help you uh, or have an adult do it um, and, and take that to a, again, a wildlife rehabilitation center or somewhere that can care for the bat. But they don't, yeah, they don't really, they don't attack people. Great question. All right. I'm going to bring in our next group that's joining us, I believe. Uh, that they're joining us uh, from Meridia in Mexico. Is that right? Yes, that's right. <laughs> All right. Great to have you joining us today. Thank you. Um, so uh, my students have a question. It might be a bit random, but they would like to know uh, what are the species of bats that people eat in China? <laughs> yeah, so there are some, you know, people do collect and eat bats in different parts of the world and bats Again, just like other wildlife are an important part of some people's diets when they don't have access to other food. Um, typically the ones that they eat are either the fruit bats because they're, they're bigger. Fruit bats can have a six foot wingspan um, and they can, their bodies are like this big. So there's more meat. Um, and, or some of the bats that live in really big colonies um, that are maybe the insectivorous bats, but they, there's, they're easy to catch. Um, it is, that is a really good thing that you bring up with eating wildlife. Um, with bats, it's hard to do hunting sustainably because bats take so long to grow and to reproduce. So it's, it needs to be done very carefully if it's going to be done. And also just like when we hunt deer or turkey here in the U.S., you need to take proper precautions. You need to um, clean it properly and cook it properly um, so that you don't get some disease or something from it. Um, and so that's something that we, you know, we're seeing now with COVID is that some of these animals that are put into markets um, in certain places are, are not taken care of properly. And then some of these things like these viruses can, can emerge. So um, it's a very, that's a very, very important topic. And I'm glad somebody brought that up. Okay. Well, we're going to, we still have some more time. So we're going to swing through a few more of the groups again to grab some more questions, but I do want to remind everybody, I hope everyone's working really hard uh, on their bats. So I'll share this again. So if you, you post those on Instagram and Twitter, um, both Instagram and Twitter for exploring by the seat of your pants. Uh, and then there's a, I think the first one is Twitter and the second one is Instagram uh, for Kristen. So you can post um, and we can check out some of those bat pictures. And I've got one ready here. I'm gonna share it now, just in the spirit of, of sharing. So 
I mean, everybody can Can't let wait. me know what they think, but we've got, okay. So I picked the, the, the fish <laughs> bat. And so this one here is, he's caught two and the other bats are super impressed. So they're holding up scorecard because they're like, wow, that was awesome. So I that hope, awesome. you, I mean, don't get discouraged out there. I'm sure all your bat pictures are gonna be great, but that's just something I wanted to share there. Thank okay. you, Joe. That was fantastic. <laughs> well, you inspired me, Kristen. So. Well, I can share mine too if you'd like. Yeah, absolutely. Mine. So I love nectar bats because that's nectar bats are the ones that I work with right now. So I drew a nectar bat. Um, so I have my basic bat, but he has really, really long tongue with those papilla or those hairs on it to help lap up nectar. It looks kind of scary. It looks like he's like breathing fire or something. But it does, yeah. Or eating yeah. a big centipede. Yeah, it does. Some bats do eat centipedes, actually. Yeah. There we go. Nope, <laughs> All right. And that does actually bring up the nectar bat. There's a group in California uh, who are tuning in from North Hollywood, California. And Bianca wants to know about the nectar eating bats. Can they, you know, how much are they eating? Can they get trapped in the flower if it's really sticky? It sounds like she's really curious about how they're getting that nectar. Yeah, that's a fun question. So can they get trapped? Um, I've never heard of a nectar bat getting trapped in the nectar, but they certainly get covered in the sticky nectar a lot of times because like I mentioned, bats don't have beaks, like those long beaks like hummingbirds. So they can't just like hover in front of the flower. They actually have to like get onto the flower. <laughs> so they do get kind of sticky um, on their bodies. But then they go and they fly to their roost and they hang and then they clean themselves and they lick off the nectar. So it's kind of like a, a second snack after they've already eaten. Um, they get the nectar off their body. But um, yeah, there's if you just YouTube uh, search for bats drinking nectar or like bats and cactus flowers, you'll see they just like shove themselves into the flowers. It's pretty fun to watch. All right, very cool. Let's bring our very own Batman back, representing his crew. Hi, um, we were just wondering, you talked about bats that had six feet wingspans. We were wondering, like, what's the biggest bat and then what is the smallest bat? Oh, I love this question. So the biggest bat is one of the fruit bats. It's a flying fox um, and it has the six foot wingspan. Um, so from wingtip to wingtip. Uh, but that bat only weighs about two to three pounds. So it's a very light bat, but it's got huge wings. And again, those ones only eat fruit. Now, the smallest bat in the world is the bumblebee bat, or called the kitty's hog-nosed bat. And it is the size of your thumb tip. So just the tip of your thumb. And it weighs less than a penny. So you have anywhere from just thumb tip to six foot wingspan and everything in between. All right. Uh, Mr. Patrick's grade eights, you guys have another question for us. Uh, up there, up there. Um, you can stand back a bit. There you go. Can you see yourself? Yeah. Okay, yes. Uh, can bats spread diseases like coronavirus? Great question. So they are, they can carry viruses, they can carry diseases, uh -huh. just like other animals. So they can if we get into very close contact with them. And that's why if you ever find a bat on the ground, you want to not touch it with your bare hands. We can't get diseases from just being around bats. Um, it's, they're, they're perfectly safe to be flying around or to be roosting near your house. Um, it's really when we touch them. Um, so that's why we should not touch them. Um, but like I said before, in terms of diseases, um, they, we don't know if they have any more diseases than other animals if you account for the number of species. Um, so basically the key thing is with any wildlife is don't touch them. Great question. All right. Very good advice. Uh, Ms. Jankos Fab Forest, do you have another question for us? Mute. The question uh, was very similar to the question you uh, asked, were asked earlier about size. Um, Emmy was asking about the size of bats and you answered that really well. Another question earlier, you did touch on it and uh, what got you into the whole bat love uh, and <laughs> you there with uh, loving and, and investigating bats? Yeah, I, I fell in love with bats at a very young age when I was like, 
two, three, four years old. Um, I actually had the book Stella Luna. It's a kind of the original children's book about bats. Um, and it came with a, a stuffed animal that had Velcro wings. So you could wrap the, the bat around your arm. Um, and I just loved that, that stuffed animal in that book. And so in Girl Scouts, I was a Girl Scouts from kindergarten all the way through high school and college. And we would take night hikes during camps and we would go and listen for the wildlife at night and we'd get to see the bats flying around and you can sometimes hear them like clicking as they fly around. And that's when I was like, I was really drawn to them um, when I was really little. And then, like I said, in sixth grade, I got to do that bat house project where I actually did my first like helping bats. And that was my first time learning how to help them. And basically after that, it was, it was a love ever since. All right, let's go back to the warm weather people in San Diego. How are we doing, Miss Becker? There you go. Still warm, still warm. <laughs> Although I'm wearing a sweatshirt, but I'm, <laughs> but it's you know 65, <laughs> but I'm cold. <laughs> um, our question relating to the last question. It's amazing how these just coincide and and mesh into each other. What's been your most fascinating experience as an adult in your uh, career now? Oh, it is so hard because working with bats is so cool because you get to like stay up all night. I'm a night owl. So like working with bats is perfect. You get to, you know, be out at night, see things a lot of people don't get to see. Um, I think two of my, my favorite experiences are when I was in Australia working, I lived in Australia for a year to study an, a critically endangered bat species. And I got to go into a cave, a gigantic cave that had about 40,000 of these bats in it that had been living there for thousands of years over generations. And so you can imagine if there's been bats in that cave for thousands of years, you can imagine how much guano or poop has piled up in the cave. So as we had to basically get deep into the cave, which meant we had to climb up these mounds of guano that were like as tall as a building um, to get to where we needed to go. So I know that sounds really gross, but it was like a really fascinating experience for me as a bat biologist. Um, and then my other favorite experience was also in Australia when we were caving and we found this bat skeleton that was still hanging from the cave wall. And it was completely just a skeleton by that point. And that's because bats don't actually have to use energy to hold on. Uh, they, they have a tendon in their foot that locks into place when they hang, so they don't have to use energy to hang. Um, so that's why you can find dead bats still hanging like years down the road. I think that was a really cool, cool thing to see. All right, let's bring in our grade fives in Pennsylvania one more time. Um, hi, so our question actually kind of goes along with the fact that bats sleep upside down. So our, there's a few that kind of go together. Do all bats sleep upside down? Um, why do they sleep upside down? And does do are there any issues with, they were wondering about how blood would go to our heads. Does it go to bats? Yeah. Oh, this is a fun question. So yes, all bats hang upside down. So all bats um, are adapted with their, their feet and their leg bones and muscles. They're adapted to hanging upside down. They cannot perch like a bird can perch, <clears throat> so they all do hang upside down. Uh, why do they hang upside down? One reason is because it allows them to roost in places that other animals can't go. So it allows them to roost in places like caves, on like cave walls, where things like snakes and owls cannot reach them. So it helps them stay away from predators. And it also helps them fly. So when they're hanging upside down, all they have to do to fly is they let go and then they swoop down and fly. So it's a kind of a quick way for them to fly away if there is a predator nearby. Um, and then any issues? Um, no, they actually don't have any issues because they don't have enough blood in their bodies to cause that issue with gravity um, that we get, you know, when we hang upside down our head, our blood rushes to our head, but that does not happen with the bats because they don't have enough, enough blood for that to happen. So it's uh, it's a pretty cool adaptation for them. Great question. All right. Well, Kristen, another great hangout. Thank you so much for taking us into the world of bats. 
sharing some of the awesome things they do, you know, for us for free uh, in the ecosystem, sharing all the amazing variety uh, of species. I want to remind everybody who's tuning in to use those hashtags, or sorry, not hashtags, to uh, tag us on Twitter and Instagram. We want to see those bat pictures. Um, shout out to the YouTube classrooms. Thank you for sending in so many great questions. And of course, to our camera educators and classrooms, always great to see you. Uh, and thanks for joining us today. Um, we're going live in about eight minutes with Grace Young, a National Geographic Explorer, just like uh, Kristen, but we're going ocean style this time, a little ocean robotics, if anybody wants to stick around uh, on YouTube for that. So Kristen, great to have you. Thank um, you. Thanks so much for joining us today. And we look forward to our next bat hangout. Thank you, everyone. Do bat hands. Bye, everyone. <laughs> See you, everyone. <laughs>